Lord, I just pray for grace with this live stream, that your uh, will and your word would go out to those who would need to hear it. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. I ask you to bless this live stream in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, just a second here. Uh, I was going to start out with reading a few psalms, so let's read some psalms before we start here. Let's read Psalm 63. O God, thou art good, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus I will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with as with marrow and uh, fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the, the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul Followeth hard after thee, uh, thy right hand upholdeth me. But uh, those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Amen. That is Psalm 63. Okay, so we're just going to wait for some people to come in here before I uh, um, get into I'm going to talk about the calendar and kind of go over some things and explains how it works compared to our western calendar and stuff like that <clears throat> so in the meanwhile i'm just going to read a couple psalms here while we're waiting for some people to come in so let's see psalm 52 um while we're waiting for some people to come in here uh, hi courtney welcome to the live stream i'm going to go over the calendar i'm going to talk about the jewish calendar for a little bit so um let's see why why boast psalm 52 why boastest thou thy uh, miss thou mischief um I'm sorry, let me start again. Psalm 52. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. The tongue deviseth mischiefs, like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more, uh, more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living selah the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him lo this is the man that made not god his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness but i am like a green olive tree in the house of god i trust in the mercy of god forever and ever i will praise thee forever because thou hast done it and i will wait on thy name it is good uh, it, it for it is good before thy saints that is psalm 52 okay so i'm just going to read a couple psalms here while we're waiting for some people to come in here so comparing calendars yep absolutely okay so let's do psalm 54 uh, save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words 
my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek my soul. They have not set God before them, Selah. Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. He shall reward evil unto mine enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. For he hath delivered me out of all trouble, and mine eye hath seen his desire upon mine enemies. That is Psalm 54. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Um, all right, uh, let me just look at comments here. So, yep, topic comparing calendars. Yep, I probably should. Is there a way to change the topic in the middle of the live stream? I probably should do that. Um, tell me where do you come from? Uh, I'm from the Midwestern United States, Northern Great Lake, Northern Great Lakes region. Uh, let's see, we are waiting for a few more people. Yep, topic comparing calendars. Yep. Shalom. Welcome, Stephanie. We're just waiting for a couple more people here, and then we're going to go ahead and get into the calendar stuff. So that's referring to the nation of Israel, isn't... Uh, that's referring to the nation of Israel, uh, that isn't you. Um, so uh, you're right, I, I'm not ethnically Jewish. However, um, we are grafted in, but there still is a, a, um, like a cultural difference between uh, Jew and Gentile, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. So... Um, so yeah, I understand what you're saying there, but at the same time, for those who are believers in Christ, we are fellow heirs uh, with the Commonwealth of Israel, according to the New Testament. Uh, shalom, confirm topic. Um, let's see. Uh, so how do I... Is there a way to change the topic in live stream? Let's see here. Um, how do I go about... Maybe it's in admin settings? Um, hmm. I don't know if I can change the topic while I'm actually in the live stream. Let's see. Hello, my Jesus-loving friends. Amen. Um, you come from the Wodowos? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I've never heard that word before. Um, all my ancestors were, were uh, pagan worshippers, but then we all were patient pagan worshippers. It's actually in the Bible that even talks about how like the, the ancestors of the Jewish people were originally pagan worshippers. So um, we all come from pagan, worshiper, pagan worshippers but, and, and idolaters, but... Because of what Christ did on the cross, uh, we become new creations. Um, the old person has passed away, and we are new creations in Christ. So we're no longer from that kind of ancestry. Um, okay, we're comparing calendars. Hi. Jump on back in. Look, in, look into it. Um, let's see. Uh, no, I, I didn't notice the pen at all. I, that might have been just one, one person that had an issue with it. I didn't notice the pen clicking. That didn't... I, I didn't bother me one bit. I didn't have an issue with it at all. So, um, let's see here. Okay, do you know who Melchizedek? Yeah, the 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 the, the, the most priest of the Most High God um, from Genesis. He met Abraham after the after the uh, battle of the five kings versus the four when Abraham went and rescued Lot. So, um, okay, we're gonna get into some calendar stuff here. So let's talk about Western calendar and let's talk about the biblical calendar, right? So first, let's take a look at why, where does the calendar come from? Where do we get the, the whole thing with timekeeping and the stars and stuff? Well, it actually comes from Genesis chapter 1, right away in the Bible, right? So it says on day 4 of creation, uh, we're going to go here, and it um, starts in verse 14 of Genesis chapter uh, 1. It says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. So we have timekeeping here, but then we also have, uh, there's a word called moedim, which means appointed times. So this would be like holidays or times to get together, um, the God's appointed feast days and so forth. But then they can also be for signs. Um, so God can use them to designate things that are going on in the heavens, like the Star of Bethlehem, for example. That was a sign, right? Um, so God basically uses the sky as his clock, right? Now, some people take that clock and they begin to worship the things in the sky and they begin to read into it a little too much, like, you know, reading tea leaves or so forth. And so they turn the clock into a giant fortune cookie and it was never meant to be used that way. And so when we turn the clock into a giant fortune cookie and try to, you know, tell things about what's going on in our lives and create horoscopes and all that kind of stuff, and we start worshiping the stars, God forbid anyone should do that, 
that's a type of idolatry because now we're worshiping created things instead of worshiping the creator who made those things, right? And so when we worship the created things, that's a form of idolatry and um, it, that's where we get astrology from. And astrology is a sin according to the Bible, right? But originally God's design was to use the sky for a clock. Now, what do we use today? We actually don't entirely go by the sky anymore. We kind of, uh, yeah, so the zodiac actually, the zodiac signs itself are, are it's a constellations that are in the sky. It's actually a way to map out the heavens. So if you look on a clock and you see like one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 12, there's 12 numbers. The zodiacs are kind of like the, the numbers on the clock, one through 12. Um, it's when those zodiac signs then get uh, transferred into astrology where they start reading all this stuff into the zodiac signs, that's when it becomes sinful. So the comparison that I always use um, when we're talking about a clock versus astrology is imagine if I were to say to someone, I'll meet you at uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow, okay? So when the little hand is on the 2 and the big hand is on the 12, I'm going to meet you at that time tomorrow. Now, if we showed up tomorrow and uh, you're waiting and all of a sudden I, I, I arrive at 2 o'clock on time, you wouldn't worship the clock, right? You wouldn't say, oh my gosh, the clock predicted the future. And, and that's amazing. The clock can tell, you know, tell, foresee events in the future and stuff. You wouldn't start like reading the clock and say, well, what happens if the big hand's over here or the little hand, you know, how does this affect my life? Does this mean I'll get riches or meet the right person or lose a job or stuff like that? You wouldn't, you wouldn't read all those things in the clock just because it did that. Because the clock is basically just a tool to be able to convey a message that I said, I'll meet you when the clock does this, right? When the clock says two o'clock, that's what time I'll meet you. So we shouldn't be worshiping the clock and started reading all these things into it. Well, the stars in the sky are God's clock, right? So God uses the stars to tell times, and he can also create signs to let us know when certain things are going to happen, like the star of Bethlehem. But that's basically timekeeping. And he does have information that he embeds in the stars, but it's not like astrology, because there is a verse in the Bible. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll give you this example here. It says, the heavens pour forth knowledge day and night. Um, it's in the Psalms. Hang on a second here. Uh, actually, okay, I'm going to think what it is. Um, let's see, heavens. Uh, sometimes I got to think of the keywords that I, that I search for in order to find them. So, um, let me, okay, no, that's not it either. Um, does anyone know this verse I'm thinking of, this, this Psalm, uh, that talks about like the, the heavens declare the knowledge, um, of God. Okay, it's Psalm 19. Here we go. Okay, so Psalm 19, 1. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day, they uttereth, uh, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. So God can have information embedded in the stars. He can show knowledge. But it's that's not the same thing as astrology. Astrology is when you start turning the whole thing into a fortune cookie, right? This is for God's purposes. So he uses uses them, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, for signs, seasons, days, and years. And that's the appropriate use of the stars in the sky. It's a giant clock. And then man, when they start worshiping those things and reading into it and start doing all this, you know, astrology kind of stuff, that's when it becomes sinful. So, um, let me just go back here and check the comments real quick to see if I missed anything. Um, hang on one second here. Okay, so, uh, just one second. Um, how about Solomon and the Keys of Solomon? I'm not really going to get into that right now. Um, let's see, so then, uh, okay, hang on one second here. Ho holiday, yeah, holidays, holy days. So a, a holiday, a, a hallowed day or a holy day is a day that's set aside for something of a, of a holy purpose. Because to be holy means it's set aside, right, for that purpose. So something that has to do with God, that's set aside, sanctified for, for God. So like the Sabbath day, six days we work, but we don't work on the sixth day, because on the seventh day, because that's the day of rest. It's actually a day to spend with your Creator. So it's a holy day. It's set apart. Um, okay, uh, Shem and Josh. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, no, we had plans and meant, so I wouldn't... Uh, and so I wouldn't think it was right. So you wouldn't think it's a clock. Exactly. You wouldn't, you wouldn't worship the clock, but that's what, that's what people have done. They've, they've turned the clock into astrology and start worshiping the, the creation rather than the creator. Um, so then we go to the yeah, astronomy. A better way to refer to this is biblical astronomy, right? Not astrology. Um, 
like the lady with the crown of 12 stars, right? Revelation chapter 12, the, the woman clothed with the sun, the moon, her feet, and the crown of 12 stars. That actually tells a point in time, if you understand what's kind of being, being told in that, that verse. So month, moon, yep, you get the, the, the cycle of the moons is where we get the word month from. Um, so let's see. Okay, hang on one second here. Um, okay, uh, he was saying astrology factoring the zodiac signs. Yeah, the, the, the zodiac in itself isn't bad. Um, I actually kind of suspect that maybe Adam is the one who named the zodiac because the, the word zodiac, you see the word zoo in there? Um, it's like the, the animals in the sky. And so Adam was actually in charge of naming the animals on earth because God brought all the animals to him. So I kind of have a suspicion that maybe he also named the, the, the sky animals. So speak too, that, um, he's the one who organized the zodiac possibly. Um, but that would have been under the leading of God. So um, that's not in the Bible. That's just kind of a guess because the, the Bible didn't say one way or the other where it came from. Um, the moon isn't a star. Well, that that is true. The moon isn't a star, but there are uh, five, there are five visible planets called wandering stars in in ancient times that, that go through the night sky, and then there's the sun and the moon. So you actually have seven uh, heavenly luminaries uh, that go through. The, the night sky that move and five of those are planets known as wandering stars and then you have the sun and the moon um so let's see Th that you can see with the naked eye there are other planets but those you need a telescope okay so are also, also the stars aren't suns that's a well that, yeah that's in a whole other topic um if uh, let's see okay so stories of many ancient cultures predating well the bible is true um okay so now Having said that, let's talk about how this clock in the sky works, right? So we're going to go take a look here on the uh, Stellarium, an astronomy program, and then we're going to understand a couple things. Now, the calendar that we use today in the West is a, called um, the, uh, uh, the the Gregorian calendar, and it was um, by a, a Pope Gregory. I can't remember if it was like Gregory the, you know, 6th or 14th or something like that. But anyways, he changed the calendar in about the 16th, 1500s or so. But really all he did was just make some slight adjustments to an earlier calendar that had been in place for some time known as the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar was created by Julius Caesar. And it used to be before the Julian calendar that for the most part, most ancient cultures would look to the skies and that's how they would figure out what month they're in and what, what time of year it was and when to plant things and stuff like that. However, because uh, there were some disagreements and discrepancies, um, Julius Caesar wanted to have a calendar that was fixed and set in stone on paper. So, um, so let's see here. Uh, for for uh, what was his name? The Great Cornholio or whatever. Uh, my mods are awesome. I trust them completely, and whatever they uh, want to do for for handling the room, I I endorse that. I am totally on board with them 100. percent So. Um, and so anyways, uh, so getting back to the Julian calendar, um, he wanted to put this thing on paper, right? He wanted to have this thing set in stone. So he created a calendar where he, instead of going by the cycles for the moon for the months, where it used to be that the months were established and when you'd see a new moon, a full moon, and a new moon again, that would be one month. He put this down to set days on paper adjusted to a 365-day uh, lunar year, I mean a solar year, right? So what happened is now we have like January, February, March, etc. on our calendar. And those months are no longer fixed to the cycles of the moon. Now that they're set in paper, the cycles of the moon have gotten away from what our calendar on paper does. So in a way, Caesar changed the times and the seasons, right? And so, oh, you're totally welcome. I'm, I'm blessed to have you guys, have you here as moderators. I mean, uh, it's kind of hard to do both at the same time. So thank you so much for what, for what you are doing. Um, so uh, anyway, so Ju Julius Caesar put this stuff down on paper and, uh, because of that, now the paper calendar over time didn't match up with what was going on in the skies. Okay. And so we have like January, February, March, December, all that kind of stuff. Those months that used to be based on what the moon did are now just fixed dates on our calendar. So Julius Caesar changed the, the, the times and the seasons by, by putting this down on the calendar. Well, why is that important? Because God originally put his appointed times in the stars. We would know what the holidays are based on what God put in the heavens, in the stars. And when we're keeping track by his clock, we would know when we were to meet and keep certain holidays and so forth. 
So when Julius Caesar changed the calendar and he put it down on paper, that also changed the, the laws for the different appointed times when people were supposed to get together for holidays and stuff. So it creates all kinds of different problems. Now, in today's day and age, like I have to use multiple calendars in a way because if I'm going to go to work or go an appointment and so forth, in order for me to be able to make those arrangements with other people, they're all using the Julian calendar. So I have to refer to it as like, it's I'll meet you at Wednesday on March 3rd or something like that. I have to go by that calendar in order to do work, right? But when I deal with the religious holidays and so forth, I have to go by what I believe is God's calendar. And that's originally starts in the stars. So that's the calendar that was in ancient times before all this began. So let's talk a little bit now, looking at this um, sky map here, how that has actually worked in the stars. So um, the Julian calendar and later the Gregorian calendar, which was simply an adjustment to that. Um, and the, interestingly enough, when the Gregorian calendar came along in the 1500s, in order to make an adjustment, there is actually a year in history that has like 13 less days in it because that was the year that they adjusted the Gregorian calendar. So there, we have 365 days, except for, you know, every four years we have a leap day, but we have 365 days going all the way back to about the 1500s. But then there's a year in the 1500s that is missing 13 days because I think it's 13 because that's the year that they adjusted from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar and they had to cut out some days to do that adjustment. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, but anyway, so in ancient times, let me, let me uh, go to my time thing here. In ancient times, the new year would start in the spring. We actually read about this, uh, for example, in the book of Exodus, where it says, uh, this shall be the beginning of months for you. Um, and it was talking about the spring, right? Because that's when you would, uh, that's when planting would time would happen. You would plant in the spring and then you'd grow the crops all year long and you'd harvest them in the fall. So in ancient times, the new year always started in the spring. Um, and, and when they switched from the, uh, from the Julian calendar, to the Gregorian calendar, and when they, they switched to the, or actually when they switched to the Julian system in general, there were still people that would keep the New Year's in the spring as opposed to January 1st or around the winter solstice, right? And so there are some people that did not want to switch over to the, the, the system under the Julian or the Gregorian calendar system. So the people that were still keeping the spring time as the New Year those people were referred to as April Fools because they were celebrating New Year's on, at the beginning of the spring in April, right? And so April Fool's Day is a, is a harkening back to the time when people were still thinking of April 1st around that time, approximately as the beginning of spring, okay? So that's where we kind of get that from. But uh, under the Julian and Gregorian system, they switch it to like January 1st in that era. area. But anyway, so in the spring, in, in ancient times, um, there are... As we mentioned, there are 12 uh, signs in the zodiac, and these are basically like the numbers on the clock. They're just constellations. So don't think of this like astrology when they start taking the zodiac and turning it into like horoscopes and stuff like that. These are just constellations in the heaven that are used for mapping out the sky and keeping track of how God's clock works, okay? So in, in ancient times, the, the new year would start in the spring when the sun was in the constellation of Aries. Um, now, here's one interesting point that I have to uh, point out here. Um, the whole zodiac, normally the, the sun would be in Aries at the time of the spring equinox, but the whole zodiac shifts slowly over the course of like over 2,000 years. And so uh, I heard people say that's why uh, we call April Fool's April Fool's because it's actually new. Yeah, that, that's a good example. Of it. I mean, it's not specifically April 1st because um, that's based, that's still based on the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar is a fixed calendar as opposed to going by the sky. But it's like around that time, March and April. But yeah, they would refer to them as April Fool's for that reason. So um, it, it, the, the whole zodiac, it takes about 2,000 years, but the equinoxes will actually shift over time. So if you go back like 6,000 years ago, the spring equinox was actually when the sun was in Taurus. That would be planting time. Um, yeah, it is pretty cool. Yeah. So then uh, over time, over like a couple thousand years, slowly the, it would happen that spring would actually come about when the sun was in Aries. Okay. And then around the time of Jesus, the equinox shifted to where the sun was in Pisces. So the, the fish is here. Now we're getting into the point where the, where spring equinox is about the time when the sun is starting to enter into Aquarius. 
So if you ever heard that that ancient, and I mean not ancient, if you ever heard that song from the '60s, you know, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That song. So um, that's actually a reference to the shifting from the spring equinox from the prior age when, when it was in Pisces over to the spring equinox starting in Aquarius. Okay. So it takes about every 2,000, 2,500 years or so roughly for this to happen. And the whole huge cycle of it going through all the zodiac and the spring equinox coming back to the starting point again, that is called uh, the platonic year. Okay, So about every 2,000 years, 2,500 years or so, you, have, you actually shift from one age to the next. That, that shift, that time period, these are called ages. So you see this referred to in ancient times, when will be the end of the age? When will be the start of the new age? And you hear that used in like astrology and stuff. They talk about the coming of the new age because they see this shift like there's, they think there's something really big going to happen when we shift out of the age of Pisces and go into the age of Aquarius. And they read into all this stuff about it and stuff like that. So that's where the, the new age movement comes from, right? But they're just getting it from this idea on, the, on God's clock where you have a shifting of an age. So... Um, so you might even read about that in the Bible where it talks about like when will be the, the, the end of the age and stuff like that. So ages are only about uh, 2,000 to 2,500 years long. So originally, um, when the sun was in Taurus, that was back around the time of creation, uh, roughly, um, that would have been the spring equinox. But it, for the most part in ancient times, when the sun was in Aries, that was the, the springtime. Okay, That was the beginning of the year. So um, that was originally, when we originally established the beginning of the year of the months in the book of Exodus, that would have been when the sun was in the, the constellation Aries during the spring equinox, okay? So what happens is, you know what, I'm going to go back to creation here on my timeline here because it, it gives a really good example of how this works. But let's go to the year um, 3060. Uh, the principles will apply, but I'm going to, uh, whether it's in the past or the future, but I'm going to go back to this year because it shows it really well. So I'm going to go back to what I have for the date of creation, which is 3967 um, BC, okay? And so um, you actually got to do on Stellarium, you got to do 3966 because you got to adjust for one year because there's no year zero. So that's just the way they do it on their software. But anyway, so here's 3967 BC. So we're going to go back to when the sun is in the constellation of... Um, Aries and use that in order to explain how the, the ancient calendar works. And the, the Jewish calendar is, uh, oh, your phone keeps messing up. I'm sorry. Oh, well, if, if, I, if you miss anything, if you want me to repeat anything, just let me know and I will, I will re go back over it again. So, um, okay. So in ancient times, again, as I mentioned, the, the, the new year would start when the sun was in the constellation of Aries because that is the spring, right? So we're gonna go here now. Um, so let me let me bring up the houses here. Hang on a second. Okay. So these are these are arbitrary. These lines here. I don't know if you can see these purple lines, but they're arbitrary. This is just what the artist is doing in. But approximately that is considered the house of that constellation. Okay. And so um, the when the sun is in this house, when it's in this constellation here. That is when you would have the, the new year in ancient times in the spring. Now, what's the first day of the month on, the, on God's calendar? The way they would establish the first day of the month is when the moon would pass by the sun. So it isn't just that the sun is within that certain constellation on God's clock. You have to start the month when you see the moon pass by the sun and you would see the first sliver of the new moon. And in order for them to establish the first day of the month in ancient times, and particularly at the temple and in, in Judaism, they would have to have two witnesses that would come and see the first sliver of the new moon and say, yes, we saw it. And then we know it's the first day of the month. And so if you don't, uh, that can happen actually on one of two days um, because the, the first sliver of the new moon may not show up for a day or two. So they would refer to that in Judaism as the day when no man knows the day or the hour. It's a Jewish idiom. The reason why they would call it the day when no man knows the day or the hour is because they don't know on which day the new moon will be spotted, uh, the, the first sliver of the new moon. So they don't know what day the month actually will start. It's very important for them to have two witnesses in order to establish that because if you know what day the first day of the month is, then you know what day the other subsequent holidays will follow on because it's very important to know what, what God's meeting uh, appointed times are, right? So you have to figure out the month, the day of the month, in order to know when you're supposed to do your religious holidays. So in this case here, I'm going to go back to what I have for the 
the uh, first day of creation. Hold on a second here. Um, let me go to roughly midnight or so um, on the okay on the twelfth, and then we'll go to uh, when the sun is in the constellation. Sorry if I'm making y'all dizzy here with all this moving around. Okay, so this is when the sun is in the. Um, hang on a second here. We'll do this. Okay, so when the sun is in the constellation of Aries, that is the start of the new year. So this is this is what I have actually for the date of creation. Okay, so um, on this calendar and on the date of creation, when I look up in the sky, what I found, um, and I, I got this date by going through my chronology, and I just traced my chronology, re my study of the Bible back to what I felt the Bible was showing as the the first year of creation, and this is what's in the skies on that date. Okay. So the first month is when the sun is in Aries, the ram, and then the moon, um, actually at this, on this start of the month, it's actually an eclipse of the sun at the same time, okay? And not only is it an eclipse of the sun, you can see here that Aries, the ram, has his foot on, on like there, like he's creating, right? So, and, and this, I, I compare Aries as a symbol of Jesus, the, the lamb of God who uh, was slain from the foundation of the world. So, um... This is Aries the Ram, and this is the first day of the month. But what happens is you have to have uh, the first sliver of the new moon shown in order to establish the month, okay? So if I go, uh, let me go ahead and zoom in here on the moon, okay? Now if I go ahead and I go a few hours in time forward, what you're going to see is eventually um, as the moon is going to start turning from a dark moon um, into a moon that has a little bit of a sliver to it, okay? And when you see the first sliver, that's, so right now it's about a half a percent illuminated. So there's a little tiny sliver that would start to emerge on this side. And when two people see that, that would be the start of the month on their calendar, okay? And so what we have here is I have, there's two planets actually in ancient times that I have witnessing this event. And I have the sun, I mean, the Mars representing the earth because Edom, Adama, it's the red, the red planet representing earth. And then Venus is referred to in ancient times as the queen of heaven. So heaven is the sky. So you'd have the heavens and the earth. And these are acting as two witnesses for the first sliver of the new moon. Okay. So you'd have two to establish the first day of the month. So this is called a lunar solar calendar. Okay. As opposed to our Western calendar, our Gregorian calendar, which is known as a solar calendar. It's just based on 365 days per year. A lunar solar calendar goes both on the, the 365 days of the solar year, but it also goes on the 12 cycles of the moon called, uh, those are lunar months. So each time the moon goes through a cycle, that's known as a lunation, okay? So what I'm going to do here is we're going to watch, we're going to follow the moon here, and we're going to see that after about 15 days, it's going to become a, a full moon. So watch how it's starting to be a sliver here. And so it's getting, the moon is getting brighter and brighter. And then finally, uh, about halfway through the month here, we have a full moon, okay? So that full moon is the midway point on the Jewish calendar for a month. When you see the moon is full, that is halfway through whatever month you're in on the Jewish calendar. And then what happens is the, the moon will start to go the other way. It'll start to get uh, darker and darker. And then it will get to the point where it passes by the sun again. Okay, so now it's passing by the sun again. But if you notice... The sun is no longer over here in the constellation Aries. It's moved over one sign on the zodiac, okay? Halfway through the month is the full moon, correct. And so, um, so now we see that the sun has moved over one sign. And the reason for that is because the sun will spend one month approximately in each sign of the zodiac. So it takes one full year for the sun to go through all, sign, all 12 signs of the zodiac. The moon will go through the zodiac once a month, right? So it started out, we had the moon that uh, it was passing by the sun when it was in Aries. That was your first month. So now when the sun has shifted over one sign and the moon is passing by the sun it, it, when it's in the next sign, that's the start of the next month. So every time the moon passes by the sun on the, on the Jewish calendar or the ancient calendar, that's the start of a new month. And remember, you have to have two witnesses that see the first sliver. So it actually has to go a little bit past it in order to start the month, right? So like in this case here, we got the moon, it's gone past it right now. It's like 2.2% uh, illuminated. So it's actually um, this month probably would have, hang on a second here. Let me zoom in on the moon. This um, this month will probably would start quite a bit later. So like probably around here is where the month would start because you got to see the first sliver of the new moon. 
So um, let me read some comments here real quick. Uh, let's see, day or two after the new moon is the start of the new month. Correct. So you got to see that first sliver. That could happen on one or two days, and that's why they refer to it as the day where no man knows the day or the hour. That's the start of the month. So here's the thing. The, the moon will go through 12 lunations, 12 cycles in the course of a year on the Jewish calendar. But the problem is that for a moon to do a, a, a full cycle is about like 29 to 30 days approximately, right? But if you add that up, it's going to go through those 12 cycles quicker than the sun will actually move through the entirety of the zodiac. Because the sun will take 365 days and a quarter to go through a solar year. The moon will do its 12 cycles a little bit shorter of that. You'll have a few days left over. And so the problem is that every year that goes by when you go through the 12 months, you're going to have a few days left over in your calendar, which means that pretty quickly your calendar is going to get off track if you're just going by 12 lunations or 12 months. So what they do in the Hebrew calendar in order to adjust that, and what they did in ancient times, is they would add a leap month about every three or four years or so. And this is how they would, they would get the, the months reset. So about every three or four years, you would add a 13th month. Okay, on the Hebrew calendar, this is called Adar 2, because Adar is the 12th month. So when you have a leap month, they add what's called Adar 2. Uh, my phone's dying. If I if it dies, I'll charge it and try to get back on. Okay, no problem. And if we miss anything, I can certainly go over it again. It's not a problem. So, so on the Jewish calendar, they would they would have this Adar 2 that would happen every um, few years or so. And every 19 years the Hebrew or the ancient calendar and our modern calendar, the Ju Gregorian or Julian calendar, um, those will match up every 19 years. And there's really no reason why they should match up every 19 years other than God made it that way. There's like no astronomical mathematical reason. It just It's just like the same thing with the sun being able to eclipse, the, the moon being able to eclipse the sun. There's really no reason that the moon should eclipse the sun because the moon could have very easily been a little bit larger or the sun could have been smaller or could have been further away in the sky. The fact that from our vantage point, the moon looks about the same size as the sun is because God designed it that way, right? Um, other planets, they don't have, the, their, their, their eclipses don't look like that, right? So these are all things that, that uh, they're not coincidental because God designed them, but they show the, the miracle working of God, that God has his hand on all this stuff. Um, so anyways, so the, the every 19 years or so, these two calendars will link up. Um, but in the meanwhile, in those interim years, sometimes you have... Um, I should make a TikTok video about this too. Yeah, I think I will actually, because I mean, it's a long drawn out subject, but it is an important subject because people don't understand how the calendar system works. So um, so in the, in those interim years, what happens is the the Jewish calendar and our Western calendar, they'll it looks like they're shifting a little bit in comparison to each other. So sometimes like Hanukkah, right, right now we're celebrating the third day of Hanukkah tonight. Sometimes Hanukkah will be more towards Christmas. This year it happens to start at the end of November, right? Um, that's because there's these shifting around, but then you add a leap month and it pushes things forward again. So it, it all works out every 19 years and it works perfectly. It's just how they do their timekeeping between the ancient calendar and our Western calendar is a little bit different. I believe the ancient calendar is, is correct because that's the one God made. That's the one in Genesis chapter 1 that he put in the sky. And he said that the, the, the stars in the sky are for signs and seasons and days and years. We kind of use some of the things in the sky for our Western calendar. For example, days, right? A day is based on the sun going through one cycle through the sky, a full uh, daylight and a full night, right? So that's based on the sun. So that's our calendar is a little bit based on things in the skies, but we don't attach to the moon anymore. And we don't really um, uh, use the other five visible planets like they would use for appointed times and stuff in ancient times. So... Um, yeah, God's calendar is awesome. And the more you dig into it, the more amazed you, you get by saying, oh my gosh, there's no way that this was like random chance. This had to be designed by designer, right? So God's calendar is amazing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, um, hang on a second here. I'm going to go to uh, the Jewish calendar. There's a website called Hebcal. I've talked about this the other night, H-E-B-C-A-L.com. And this is where you can see the Jewish calendar. So I'm going to explain how the Jewish calendar works. Now, one thing to understand on the, on the modern Jewish calendar, um, in ancient times, the, the calendar uh, was matched up where like you would have the um, equinox, the spring starting when, uh, when the sun was in Aries. As I mentioned, over the course of about 2,000 years or so, the the sun's uh, the, the spring equinox slowly shifts over time. So it, it went through Pisces over the last 2,000 years, and it's starting to get into Aquarius. 
Well, what does that mean? That means that the, the planting time in the spring actually doesn't really start now like it did 2,000 years ago when the sun was over here, right? Now planting time starts in the spring when the sun is in Aquarius almost. And so that what's going on in the skies now is a little bit adjusted and off versus what's actually on the Jewish calendar today because the Jewish calendar today has been around for a while. And during that time, all of this stuff has shifted a bit, okay? Back when, when they were keeping it, it would have been lined up. But because it's been about 2,000 years or so since they had a temple, and since there was a council called the Sanhedrin who would establish what the calendar officially was, um, they haven't had a chance to make any of those adjustments because there's been no Sanhedrin this whole time. So because of that, the, the Jewish calendar has actually somewhat drifted over time. Um, they can correct that, but they can't do that until they're able to have a Sanhedrin meet, which means that they have to reestablish the temple, they have to reestablish the Sanhedrin. And actually, I think they did recently in a couple, the last few years, they did reestablish a type of Sanhedrin, but they still need the temple and other things, okay? So the Sanhedrin, they're the ones who, they're the official governing body of Israel, and they're the ones who can set or change the Jewish calendar and make those adjustments. On our Western calendar, we made one major adjustment under Pope Gregory, uh, whatever whatever Gregory it was, where we went from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. The, the, the Jewish calendar can't really be adjusted until there's a Sanhedrin uh, system in place. So in the meanwhile, yes, their calendar is a little bit off from what's going on in the stars. So there's actually three types of calendars that you can go by. You can go by what's in the stars now, you could go by what's on the Jewish calendar now, or you could go by what's on the Western calendar. I would say the Western calendar is the most inaccurate of them all. Um, the, the Jewish calendar is the one I kind of go by now for holidays for the reason that there's no um, Sanhedrin yet to adjust the calendar. And when they meet, I expect them to adjust it back to what's going on in the skies. So in the meanwhile, um, it's, it's understanding that, that there were certain ordained authorities in the Torah to give the Sanhedrin and the councils. This was done under Moses and when, when his father-in-law Jethro showed up and he suggested that he appoint captains of tens and captains of hundreds and so forth because Moses was taking on all this work of judging the people himself. So we, have, we see councils that were actually established in the Torah and they have authority to do certain things. And so I respect those authorities because they're established in the Torah and I respect their right to be able to make certain decrees about the calendar and stuff like that. So I, in, in a way, I kind of actually look and keep both. I keep the Jewish holidays based on the Hebrew calendar today, but I also have the expectation that that will be adjusted when the Sanhedrin meets in the future. So I could go by the stars directly now, but then I'd be in violation of those parts of the Torah that say the Sanhedrin is the one that has the right to make those decrees. Or I could go by the Jewish calendar, but recognizing that the, what the real date is going to be corrected as soon as they're able to make that adjustment. But that's kind of a complicated subject matter. So in the way, I kind of use both a little bit. Um, but why is this an issue? Well, one of the reasons why it's an issue is because if the spring starts a lot later than it did around 2,000 years ago, then things like the holiday of first fruits, right? In the holiday of first fruits, you have to take the first ripening of the barley harvest and you offer as an offering. So if spring is starting at a different point in time, then the harvest is going to, the, the barley and so forth is going to ripen at a different point in time. So how can you do the, the offering of first fruits? if you don't have the barley uh, first fruits ripening at that point in time, right? Because springtime has shifted. So that's one of the reasons why there needs to be an adjustment in the calendars for, for situations like that. So in the meanwhile, I kind of go by the, the, the Jewish calendar until that adjustment is made. So let's take a look at the Jewish calendar as, as we have it right now, okay? So in the Jewish calendar right now, we have um, the uh, the first day of the month. Now, here's here's another interesting thing. The, the Jewish names for the months, they're actually pagan names. A lot of them, um, because uh, uh, Israel, uh, Judea, had been taken into captivity in Babylon, and so there's some things that were changed when they went into Babylon. So, for example, the letters of, of Hebrew, they used to be something called Paleo Hebrew, which looked very different, but then they shifted over to what the modern Hebrew is, which is Block Hebrew. That's something they actually picked up in in Babylon from from Aramaic and stuff like that. So, the Hebrew letters we have today are not the actually ancient the Hebrew letters that they used in ancient times. Um, likewise, the names of the month that they have, a lot of them are taken from pagan Babylonian gods in the same way that we, uh, the names of our week are also taken from pagan Norse gods. So for example, Thursday, right? The, the day Thursday is named after Thor, Thor's day, right? And that's where we get the name Thursday. Same thing happened in, uh, in the Babylonian system when, when Judea was taken to captivity, some of the names of their months in their calendar, like around July, that's known as the month of Tammuz. Tammuz was a, a pagan ancient Babylonian god. 
So they they picked up some of those same things, and they actually refers to some of the names of their months after pagan gods. But we do that in English too. So um, so that's an unfortunate thing that happens in their calendar. So when you see some of the names of these months, they're actually just keep in mind they're also the names of, ironically, pagan gods. Okay, so on the on the uh, pagan calendar. Um, there's, there's 12 months and potentially 13. You have a 13th month leap month that happens every now and then, and that's uh, 8R2. So let me go to uh, the calendar here, and I'm going to go through the, the months real quick so you can kind of understand them. So we're going to go to the first month is called Nisan. And in the book of Exodus, it's called Abib, which is the ripening time of the barley harvest, uh, or and planting time and so forth. Um, but later under under the Babylonian captivity, that name gets changed to Nisan. So that happens uh, in the springtime. So hang on a second here. Um, let me actually, let me do, I'm going to show you how to use this HebCal site. So we're going to go here real quick. We're going to do uh, customized calendar settings, and I'm going to show you what all these things are so you can understand them. So we're going to do Days of the Omer, Dafyomi, uh, Weekly Torah Portions, or Parsha. Um, we'll do the Diaspora Holiday Schedule. So there's two holiday schedules here there's uh, holidays that are kept outside of Israel, and then there's holidays that are kept inside of Israel. What typically happens on the Jewish calendar is for holidays outside of Israel, they will double up the holidays. So like Passover, you will have uh, two days where they celebrate Passover. Um, just about all the holidays, except for Yom Kippur, they'll actually do them two days in a row immediately following each other. And the reason why they do that is because, again, in Israel, you would have the, the first day would start when you see the first sliver of the new moon. But by time you travel multiple time zones, that can actually shift over time so that the first day of the month in, say, America isn't the first day in Israel because we're in a whole different time zone. So for that reason, when you get outside of Israel, they just celebrate the holidays twice on both days to make sure that they don't miss it. And when you're in Israel, they'll celebrate on the same day. So, for example, the holiday at the end of the re religious cycle called Simchat Torah, normally that uh, uh, falls in Israel on what's known as Shemini Etzeret, or the last great day. Um, but outside of Israel, they'll celebrate Simchat Torah, the day that they re-roll the Torah scroll and start over their, their reading cycle in the synagogues. They'll celebrate the day, at, the day after Shemini Etzeret, or after the, the last great day. Um, but that has to do with whether or not you're inside Israel or whether you're outside Israel. So the outside of Israel is called the diaspora, or the diaspora, which means the, the dispersed population. When they were taken into captivity by the Roman Empire and the Jews were sent all throughout the world, they were dispersed, right? So this is the diaspora. And so the diaspora holiday schedule is the holidays that are kept outside of Israel. Uh, the, the other option is inside of Israel. So we'll go with the diaspora one because we're outside of Israel right now here in the West, at least I am in America. And then we'll go through, we got major holidays, minor holidays, uh, Rosh Kodesh, which is the first, the new moons. That's the first day of the month. So Kodesh means holy and Rosh means head or the first. So these are Rosh Kodesh in the Bible are the new moons, the start of the month, right? Then we've got minor fast days and minor, minor fast days are not uh, days where of less important fasts. All it means is that it's a daylight fast instead of a 24 hour fast. A uh, 24 hour fast is a major fast day. So a minor fast day is just a daylight only fast. That doesn't mean that you don't keep the fast. It just means it's not as long. Um, then we have a special uh, Shabbatot. So these are kind of like um, Sabbaths that have special meaning or importance. Then modern holidays, those are like, you know, commemorating the Holocaust, commemorating the, the restoration of the nation of Israel, things like that. Uh, days of the Omer. So days of the Omer is the days that they would count from first fruits, that's the day that Jesus w rose from the dead, until the day of Shavuot or Pentecost. And this is in the Old Testament. It says you count 49 days. This is the counting of the days of the Omer. So this is the, the Omer is a, a jar for the barley harvest, and that's where the, the first fruits would be offered in. So you would actually count 49 days from the day of first fruits until Shavuot or Pentecost, and the 50th day is Shavuot or Pentecost in the New Testament. Um, so that they have, you have to actually count that off. It's a, a mitzvah, a commandment in the Bible, to count each of those days leading up to the 50th day. Daf Yomi, that is, uh, uh, on the Hebrew calendar, that is each, it means a page a day is what it's referring to, and it's a page of Talmud a day. So for people who study the Talmud, it tells you what, uh, what page of the Talmud that they're studying uh, on the calendar that day. And they do the Talmud in a seven-year cycle. So they'll go through, the, the Talmud's huge. It's like a, an encyclopedia. There's actually two of them. There's a Jerusalem Talmud and a, and a Babylonian Talmud. But generally, they were talking about the Babylonian Talmud when they're talking about Daphiomi. 
But what they'll do is they'll, they'll have a cycle, a reading cycle, where everyone is reading the same page of the Talmud over the course of seven years and they start it over again. So on your calendar, if you see Daf Yomi, it tells you what page of the Talmud that they're studying for that particular day. And then you got the weekly Torah portions uh, on Saturdays. So those are called Parshas. And those are reading cycles. So as I mentioned, uh, Simchat Torah, which means Joy the Torah, that's a holiday that comes at the end of the religious year in the fall. And so when they re-roll the Torah scroll, they'll start over, and over the course of the year, every uh, Sabbath day, they will read a portion of the Torah in the synagogue. Those are called Parshas. And so everyone will kind of be on the same page. And we see examples of this, of Jesus in the New Testament, where he's reading from the Torah, and he gets to this one point, because that's the Parsha for that week, and he happens to be reading from this prophecy, and he tells everyone, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. And they wanted to stone him because basically he had just read the Parsha from the Torah scroll that week. And he, he added a little part at the end where he said, hey, what we just read, that was talking about me. This is Jesus talking, right? So he's saying that was talking about me. And they want to stone him for that because he added that part in the end. So uh, the Parsha is um, basically it's the portion of the, the weekly reading, the portion of the Torah scrolls that are being read that week. And then um, what we'll do is we'll do this. Actually, we're going to do this on the Gregorian year. Um, or in the Hebrew year, not the Gregorian year. So you can kind of see how that works out. Um, this part I totally disagree with. The, the current year on the Jewish calendar is the year 5782. I don't think it's 50 year 5782. When you actually look at the timeline for the Jewish calendar, the years were created later. They were created by under a guy named Hillel II, who after the Romans had conquered uh, Jerusalem and took them into captivity, they had to come up with a fixed calendar because the Jews were all in the diaspora. They all dispersed. And so to make sure that their calendar doesn't fade away and they're all doing their holidays on the same page, they actually created kind of a fixed calendar and then they haven't been able to meet to change it since. So that's they came up with the year that they're on based on a, a book by a rabbi, and the book is called uh, The Seder Olam Rabbah. Um, and the Seder Olam Rabbah was an attempt at biblical chronology where they're trying to figure out when did creation start and what year we're in. So that's where they get this year 5782. I don't think it's correct because it's something that they, they created like a few hundred years or a couple hundred years after Jesus that they came up with this. And the rest of the calendar is very ancient. It goes back to ancient times. But this year was added much later, so I don't think we're in the year 5782. But every Rosh Hashanah, they will celebrate the change in the year. We just had Rosh Hashanah not too long ago. And they will consider 5782 as the year that we just change into on the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah. I don't think that's the actual year. I think we're actually um, getting uh, pretty close to the year 6000. I think the year 6000 is around the year 2033. Um, so that's you can kind of do the math there to figure out where we're at. Okay, so then you've got um, event titles. There's two kind of uh, uh, um, strains of Judaism. There, there's Sephardic and Ashkenazi. And so Sephardic were, were the Jews that ended up mostly in Spain, and they have that kind of their own cultural tradition. And then the Ashkenazi were those that end up in Central Europe, like Poland and Germany. And so those two uh, uh, centers of Judaism throughout the Middle Ages and so forth, they kind of developed their own customs and cultures of Judaism. And so you can uh, you have Sephardic type texts and you have Ashkenazi type texts. So you can have your calendar actually set to that as well. Um, and then we can show Hebrew date and times for some event or show Hebrew date uh, for every day of the year. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and then uh, you can do candle lighting. So Shabbat, typically, when you're going to do a Sabbath, normally there is the lighting of Shabbat candles um, that before sunset. You, you definitely have to do it before sunset, but typically, typically it's done about 18 minutes approximately before sunset is the custom. And it's because you can't light a fire on, on the Sabbath, right? So in order to start Shabbat, they would typically light Shabbat candles about 18 minutes before sunset, and then they would say a, a little prayer. And it's what they're doing is they're, they're actually starting Shabbat a little bit early. The moment you light that candle, once it's lit, you can't even blow out the match. You just have to sit the match down on a, a fireproof surface and let it burn out on its own because you can't even put out a fire on Shabbat according to the, the, the modern, um, modern Judaism, right? So um, because of that, um, they would do their candle lighting and they would say this, this whole prayer and there's stuff you can see how you start Shabbat. And then should, they would start Shabbat about 18 minutes earlier. But one, the moment the candles are lit, they would consider Shabbat to have started, okay? And then... Typically, that's done 18 minutes before sundown, but again, there's some uh, other people that have different ideas when Shabbat will start. This is going to vary based on where you live, right? That's why it has enter a zip code here, because sunset is going to be vary from place to place. So to figure out where 18 minutes before your area, you can put your zip code in here and it'll tell you when, when the candle lighting is for that time. Uh, Havdalah, which is called Zit HaKokavim, um, this is, or uh, uh, nightfall rather, 
nightfall is not the same thing as sunset. Sunset is when the sun goes to the horizon. Nightfall is when the sun, when it gets dark enough that you can three, see three stars. So nightfall actually occurs after sunset because you have to get it dark enough to see the stars come out. So when you can see three small stars, that's known as, as a nightfall or Zit HaKovim. There's different disagreements about when that will start. Um, some say as early as 18 minutes, uh, some say as late as 72 minutes, but there's, um, there's something called Zman, Zman Nim where you can actually get an app on your phone. Uh, here I can, I can type it. Um, Zman Nim is what it's called. It's the, the keeping track of times. So you can actually find apps on your phone, um, where you can, uh, have the Zman Nim for your area. And this will tell you, um, exactly uh, that's what it is. It's Manim. This will tell you exactly when uh, the nightfall starts or when, um, you know, candle lighting starts and stuff like that based on what you believe is the accurate uh, minutes or time structure for nightfall and stuff. And that's important because that will tell you when Shabbat ends and when other things start, when the day switches over from one to the next and so forth. So um, if you, depending on what you use for your time for, for nightfall, um, that will tell you how many minutes past sundown it is before Shabbat ends. And when Shabbat ends, there's a ceremony, just like you had candle lighting to start Shabbat, there's another ceremony called Havdalah, which you do for closing out Shabbat, and that is actually done with a different type of candle. Usually uh, you start Shabbat with two candles um, that are Shabbat candles that are uh, designed to burn for a certain amount of time. And then closing ceremony, you will do it with a, a cup of wine and some spices that you can kind of smell to remember that the, it's supposed to remind you of the sweet, sweet smell of the Shabbat and the, and the joyous time that you had and so forth. And then there's a candle that's kind of like a, a twisted intertwined candle. It's like a braided candle. Um, it's actually multiple candles that are braided. And you do the ceremony called Havdalah, and that's how you actually close Shabbat. And so then at the end, you, you take the Havdal canna, you dip it in the wine and to put it out, and that's how you end Shabbat. And so that has to be done after nightfall, whereas the start of Shabbat has to be done before sunset, um, and then it's a certain minutes depending on what your, your uh, uh, custom is. Okay, so that's the, all the things for creating a Jewish calendar. So now we're going to actually create the calendar. So we're going to go ahead and click on it here. And so we're going to go to, um, actually, we're going to go to spring here because this is going to start at Rosh Hashanah. The, the modern Jewish calendar starts it in the fall in Rosh Hashanah, but the, the springtime, the first month is actually um, in the spring. So one thing to understand is there are four New Year's in Judaism. There's the New Year in the spring, and, and they, they still have these four New Year's today. Um, they just happen to keep track of their years by the New Year that happens on Rosh Hashanah. So here's the four New Year's. You have the New Year in the spring, which is given um, in the case of the book of Exodus, where it says this will be the beginning of months for you. That's when you do the planting in the springtime. The other three New Year's are based on when you would harvest the crops once going from the spring. And you have three things that you can tithe from to offer tithes. And those tithes have to come to fruition at different times because different crops uh, are, are harvested at different times. So you would have the first one would be your livestock, right? Um, when do you, when, what's your fiscal year for tithing livestock? Um, how do you know when you should tithe livestock on the previous year or the start of a new year? It's based on when the livestock give birth to the new animals so that you know when to establish what year that animal should be offered as a tithe, if you're offering as a tithe. So the way they do that is they stab, they base it on starting with the new year in the spring, and then they go uh, five uh, or six full months, to the beginning of the sixth month, okay, to uh, based on the gestation period of a lamb. And this is the month that's known as the first of Elul. It's the first of the sixth month on the Jewish calendar. And that's the new year for animals, okay? It's based on the gestation period of a lamb. So when a lamb begins to give birth to its first animals, uh, its, its first uh, uh, offspring, that's how they establish the start of the fiscal year. That's the new year for animals. Then you have to figure out when you're gonna do your tithes or your fiscal year for crops. So that's a month later on the first of Tishrei, which is the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. And this is what is known as Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the, the Feast of Trumpets, or um, or the, 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 the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the, head of the year is, is what it actually translates to, but it means the New Year. So Rosh Hashanah is the, 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 year, the New Year that you would establish your fiscal year for tithing of crops because they would do their harvest in the fall. So it would come about a month after the New Year for animals, okay? So now we got our, our crops and our animals, and then we have our, our, our starting point back in the spring when you plant. So there's one more New Year, and this is the New Year for trees. 
because trees can produce fruit. It would take my, maybe three years for, for a newly planted tree to produce apples or fruit or stuff like that. So there's another holiday called Tu Bishvat, where they would have a New Year's for trees, and that comes in roughly about January every year. So those are the different New Year's that they have in Judaism. But they go off of Rosh Hashanah in order to keep track of their years because they're basing it on the fiscal years for giving and offering tithes based on their crops, and that happens around the time of Rosh Hashanah during the fall harvest. But they're basing that off of the springtime planting, which we see in the book of Exodus. So that's why you have four New Year's in Judaism. So I'm going to go to the month of Adar, or Nisan rather, and so here we see, uh, for example, coming up in April of 2022, we have the month of Nisan. We have uh, uh, Shabbat HaChodesh, which is a special Shabbat. Um, and then we have a Rosh Kodesh Nisan. So that means the first uh, the, the first day of the month of Nisan. So it's going to happen on the second uh, Saturday, um, April 2nd will be the, the, new, the first of the New Year's, right? The Rosh Kodesh Nisan. That's the first New Year on the Hebrew calendar. And then we have a Parsha here that tells you what Parsha they're going to be on at that point in time. And then this is the Daf Yomi. This tells you where they're at in the Talmud, okay? So this is the, the month of Adar. And so if we go through this here, we're going to see... Um, the, here's how I kind of remember the months. I use a little uh, kind of acronym. It's I go like this. I go, uh, uh, imagine a person and their person's name is... Whoops, hang on a second here. Nista Eth. And Nista Eth works for KTSA, a television station, Okay. So Nista, her name is Nista F, okay, and she works at KTSA. So the first month is Nisan, and that's when Passover is. And then the second month is Ayar, and then the third uh, month is Sivan. And Sivan is the month when um, you have Pentecost or Shavuot, okay. The fourth month is uh, Tammuz. Uh, the, the sixth, the fifth month is Av, and so Av is when you have a very sad holiday on the Jewish calendar known as Tishba Av, or the ninth of Av, and that's the day when the temple, the first temple and the second temple were destroyed. They were both destroyed in the same day. Um, also, it's uh, a lot of other bad things have happened in Jewish history on that date. Um, so that's the ninth of Av. And then you have Elul, and uh, the first of Elul, that's the new year for, for lambs or animals. Um, and then you have the month of Tishri. The first day of the seventh month is Rosh Hashanah, or Yom, Yom Teruah. And we have uh, what's called the high holidays, or the fall holidays that happen during Tishri. So you have uh, you get Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. That's the first day of the month. Then on the tenth day of the month, you have the Day of Atonement, which is the holiest day on the, the Jewish calendar, and that's called Yom Kippur. And then five days after that, you have the start of what's known as Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And that holiday actually lasts seven days, but then there's an eighth day closing holiday called Shemini Atzeret, um, which is the last great day. And in uh, Israel, that's also the same day as Simchat Torah, where they re-roll the Torah scroll and start over again. Um, but outside of Israel, Simchat Torah is actually celebrated the, the, the next day. Um, so then you have uh, Cheshvan, uh, sometimes called Mark, Mark Cheshvan, and that's uh, uh, the 10th, uh, I'm sorry, that's the 8th month. Then you have Kislev, um, that's uh, the ninth month, and then you have uh, Tevat, that's the 10th month. And then you have... Um, uh, let's see what did I what did I uh, uh, Shabbat or Sabbat um, that is or Savan or I, I got to look at it here I forget what that one is again <laughs> I got to remember all my calendar dates here um, that is okay Heshvan Kislev and Tevet and then Shabbat Shabbat that's how you pronounce it okay so Shabbat kind of sounds like Shabbat but it's a little bit different so uh, Shabbat is the eleventh uh, month and then you have Adar that's the twelfth month. And uh, sometimes you'll have Adar 2 in a month, a year that has a leap uh, month on it. So that's where you get 13 months. So that's how I remember it. Nista Eth works for KTSA. That's how I remember my months on the Jewish calendar. And again, uh, Nisan starts in the spring and then it goes all the way through the fall. So now I'm going to show you real quick here the holiday cycle on this Jewish calendar. So we're going to go to a uh, list here. Okay, so now we can see all the different holidays and the hol Actually, there might even be something here where I could just do the holidays in general. Uh, there is. Okay. So here are the holidays on the Jewish calendar. So um, if we if we go from the, the New Year in the fall, we have Rosh Hashanah, also known as Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, we have Yom Kippur. Um, then five days after that, we have Sukkot. Sukkot, you actually, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, you actually make a booth or a sukkah and uh, you, you, you stay outside in it. Um, as best you can during the, the week that you're basically doing Sukkot. However, um, it's a commandment to be joyous on that holiday. It's supposed to be a happy holiday. And so if it's cold weather or rainy, 
Uh, a lot of people's opinions is you don't actually have to sleep in or stay overnight because it's more important to be happy than to be miserable in order to fulfill that part of the mitzvah, the commandments, because it would say it takes precedence. So a lot of people, basically what they do is they just eat their meals in the, su the sukkahs when they can, and they do for prayers and stuff. And then they'll shake a lulav, which is uh, in an etrog, which is kind of this long reed uh, plant thing and some other plants, and then a, a kind of looks almost like an orange or a lemon kind of fruit. That's also part of the mitzvah as well. It represents certain things. But So the, they'll do this during this week. It's supposed to be a very joyous festival, uh, festival holiday. And a lot of times um, they'll have communities where they put all their sukkahs in one area and like people will go from sukkah to sukkah and visit each other's families and they'll do Bible readings. It's really, really a, a awesome time of the year. It's totally fun. So then you have Shemini Yitzirah, which closes out the holiday. That's the last great day or the eighth day uh, assembly. You have Simchat Torah, which inside of Israel falls on the same day, but that's where you re-roll the Torah scroll. So if you think of Revelation, where it talks about the scroll in heaven uh, uh, rolled up like a scroll, that's like a reference to Simchat Torah. Then you have Hanukkah, which we're on the third day of Hanukkah right now. Next year, that will start in December, but in this year, it actually started late November. Um, then you have Pesach. Pesach is Passover, right? And so Pesach is when you have the Passover Seder, when you eat the Passover lamb, but it's immediately followed by um, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts about seven days. You have to get all leavened bread out of your house. So uh, uh, leaven is basically bread that has wheat in it, right? Or I mean, uh, has yeast in it where it's fermented. So you have to get anything that has like a yeast uh, leavened bread out of the house. You can have you can have crackers and things that are called matzah as long as there's not yeast in it so that it hasn't risen. But fluffy white bread that's risen from yeast, you gotta get all that out of your house during uh, the, the week of unleavened bread. Um, and then of course you got uh, the during this during Pesach you have the feast of uh, the first fruits where Jesus was risen on and that's the starting point of the counting of the Omer and then you count 49 days until you get to Shavuot Shavuot is a holiday that celebrates the uh, giving of the the Torah at Mount Sinai but in the New Testament it's also the same day that Pentecost occurs it's on the 50th day after the the counting of the Omer so in the Old Testament the law was given at Mount Sinai and that gives us our outward commandments our outward regulations but at Pentecost, on the very same day, the Torah was written on our heart, right? So it's no longer the outward Torah, it's the inward Torah that allows us to do the outward Torah to fulfill it. So the Torah was written on our heart on Pentecost. So those two kind of reflect each other, Shavuot and Pentecost. And then um, Tu Bishvat, that's the holiday that I mentioned. That's one of the minor holidays. That's the one uh, which is the New Year for Trees. Then you got Purim. Purim is the holiday that's established in the book of Esther. It's to commemorate what happened in the book of Esther where the Jewish nation was going to be wiped out. But then uh, God actually used that day to turn around and uh, allowed the, the Jewish people to um, overcome their enemies. And so they celebrate that holiday uh, Purim at that time. Uh, and then there is in Israel, there's an additional holiday called Shushan Purim because uh, uh, Jerusalem itself and some other uh, in, uh, walled cities like Shushan, you read in the book of Esther how they actually celebrated on like uh, another day, uh, like the second day or something like that. So that really only applies to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem and stuff. Then you got the holiday of Pesach Sheni. And Pesach Sheni is the is a Passover for those who could not make it to the first Passover. So we actually see this in uh, in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, when we when we read about Joseph of Arimathea, uh, how he uh, buried Jesus in, in, and got Jesus down from the cross and buried in the tomb, he probably would have had to have kept Pesach Sheni because it, he had touched a dead body at that point, and so therefore he would have been unclean in order to celebrate Passover. So he probably would have had to do the second Passover, which is uh, basically a makeup Passover for those who can't do the first. But that's actually talked about in the Old Testament. It establishes this holiday of Pesach Sheni for those who can't keep the first Passover. Uh, Lagba Omer is um, something during the uh, counting of the Omer. It's a day that actually commemorates the, the death of the yard site of a, of a, a rabbi that um, was considered very honored during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Um, and then you've got uh, Tuba Av, which is kind of like their Valentine's Day holiday in a way. Um, it's close to Tishba Av. Um, but that's kind of like the Jewish uh, Valentine's Day. Then you've got uh, Rosh Hashanah of Behemoth. That is the first of Elul. That's the new year for an for animals that we were talking about earlier um, when they do it based on the gestation period of a, of a lamb. Uh, and then you've got um, Lyle uh, Shlichot. So these are the days. So uh, this is from the first of Elul all the way up to Yom Kippur, those 40 days. 
your the idea is to do uh, uh, sh- um, or uh, prayers of repentance because the idea is that you're supposed to be repenting all the way up till the day of atonement so these would be the, the 40 days where you'd be saying it's almost kind of like lent on the catholic calendar but these are the, except lent on the catholic calendar comes in the, the round easter so these days are, are like 40 days of intensive repentance leading up to yom kippur and on yom kippur it's the idea is that you're judged whether you're found in the book of life or not for that year so like all your your deeds and your actions are, are taken into account your sins and so forth on the, on the day of atonement to consider what will happen to you during the course of the next year so people like do attend uh, 40 days of intensive repentance leading up to yom kippur uh, and then you've got uh Purim katan which is uh, another um uh kind of like uh kind of like um uh, pesach sheni it's kind of like the same thing for Purim. it's a it's an additional um celebration uh this is for if you have a leap year where you have a second adar then Purim, at which normally falls during Adar, you would have to do that during second Adar, so then they have Purim Katan, they have a second, uh, basically Purim, where they'd celebrate it then instead. So those are the, the holidays, but then you got fast days. So there's uh, several fast days, and these are mentioned in the Bible as well, like the fast of the fourth month, the fifth month, the, the seventh month, and the tenth month. It says in the Old Testament that though, there's a prophecy that those fast days will in the future be turned into days of joy and gladness. So these are some of those fast days that are being referenced here. So we have the fast for Gedalia, and Gedalia was this governor who, um, after Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Jeremiah, after Nebuchadnezzar had taken uh, Israel into captivity, he appointed this uh, a Jewish person by the name of Gedalia to be governor. But the other Jewish people did not uh, like that because he wasn't of the line of David. So they actually murdered him. So there's a fast day to commemorate that he was murdered during that time uh, as a day of sorrow for what happened to him. Then we have... Um, Sarah Batevit, and so that's a day that's commemorating the start of the siege around Jerusalem in ancient times when Nebuchadnezzar surrounded uh, Jerusalem. And then you've got the fast for Esther, and we read in the book of Esther how she called for everyone to fast for her before she went in before the king. And so they actually still keep that fast today in, in remembrance of what she, she did. Um, then we've got uh, the fast of the firstborn. This is around Pesach. And so um, because uh, God had preserved the lives of all the firstborn during the Passover in Egypt, and he killed all the firstborn of Egypt, there's today they will all the firstborn uh, will still do a fast just before uh, Passover in order to commemorate the fact that they were spared during that plague. Uh, then you've got uh, Zom Tammuz, which is another fast day, and this commemorates the day that uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually breached the walls of Jerusalem. And so this happens usually three, week, three uh, weeks before uh, the day that the temple is destroyed. So the time from Zom Tammuz, the fast of Tammuz, um, all the way until um, a, a Tish B'Av, which is the day the temple is destroyed, that three weeks in Judaism is known as the time of between the straits or dire straits. It's a time that in Jewish history, um, very a lot of bad things have happened to Jewish people during that day. So they, they're very like uh, repentant. They're very uh, prayerful during this time because it's a, a difficult time, the time of dire straits. So that goes from Zom Tammuz, that fast day, all the way to Tish B'Av. And again, Tish B'Av is the day that both the first and the second temples were both destroyed in the same day. Um, that's known as the ninth of the month of Av. And so that's that's one of the days that is a, a very mournful day. Uh, it's, it's also that day is a 24 hour fast. Um, so Yom Kippur is a 24-hour fast, and so is Tish B'Av. The other ones are, are, um, are more so minor fasts. I don't know why they have it listed in a minor fast here, because that's a 24-hour fast. So um, so that's a day that they would mem- commemorate the uh, the destruction of the temple on Tish B'Av. And then you get to modern holidays. So um, some of these are kind of like their Arbor Days and stuff like that. But then there's also some more serious ones, like Yom Shoah, uh, Shoah commemorates the Holocaust, right? So remembering that. Um, so there's... Just like we have modern holidays, you know, we have things that we created Fourth of July and things like that. Um, special Shabbatot are basically just Sabbath days where they commemorate certain kind of things or they focus on certain things, but it's essentially just a Shab- uh, Sabbath day. And then, of course, you got your new moons, your Rosh Kodesh, which you basically uh, sanctify the moon in those days. You don't really do much per se on the new moon days, except in Judaism they would say the special prayer of blessing when, uh, over the sighting of the new moon, and that's how they kind of commemorate that particular holiday. But they would keep track of that so you know when the moon starts. So that is how the Jewish calendar works. And you can actually go to Hebcal and you can do um, create your own calendar. And then from that, you can be able to um, customize it. And then you can kind of keep uh, know when the holidays are and stuff like that. Now, as I mentioned, this calendar is based on it's it really started from where the sky was a couple thousand years ago. But since the time that this calendar was created, again, the skies have drifted a little bit. So some of the things that we would see in the Jewish calendar may not exactly match up with what's going on in the stars. 
So, for example, I have a certain date when I believe that Jesus' birthday actually was, and it was around the end of August or the beginning of September in uh, 2 BC. However, because of the shifting of the stars, if I was to go by where that would be on the, the zodiac, that's going to be at a little bit later date now compared to the month that was back then, 2,000 years ago. The same thing is happening for the Jewish calendar. Some of these things, if you're going to shift it by the stars, they're going to be a little bit off. So that's why some people choose to, for example, celebrate, say, the Feast of Tabernacles a month later than the Jewish calendar, because they're going by how the stars have shifted uh, in the 2,000 years since that calendar was established. And if we if we went another 2,000 years, then it would be off two months instead of one month, right? So um, there are some people that choose to go by the stars. There are some people that choose to go by the Jewish calendar. I expect that the Jewish calendar will be readjusted back to the stars once a Sanhedrin or a council is able to be established and meet again. And I think that will happen under the Messianic Kingdom. And then they're going to be able to reconfigure those things back together so that they will have one consistent calendar. But until that date and time, people have to make a decision. Do they go by what the stars say? Or do they go by the part? Because that's in the Torah too, right? Because Genesis chapter 1, God said that the stars are for signs, seasons, days, and years. Or do they go by the part of the Torah that talks about uh, establishing these councils, these Sanhedrins, that, like Moses, where he was said appoints captains of hundreds, fifties, and tens, and recognizing that those councils have authority to establish things such as what the calendar and dates are? So do we, do we look at those parts of the Torah and say, okay, we have to uh, respect the authority that God ordained in order to allow them to establish things like the calendar? Or do we go by Genesis chapter 1 and go by what God put in the stars? So some people choose to do one or the other. Some people even choose to do both. So that's kind of uh, something where I would, you know, everyone's personal conscience can kind of figure out where they stand on that. So that's the essence of the, the Hebrew calendar and kind of how it works. And that's a lot of stuff I went through. Um, and for those of you who are still here listening, um, let's see. I, I hope I didn't confuse you too much. I hope I didn't, you know, uh, hopefully it was a little bit easy to understand, but that's a lot of information I kind of threw at you there. So any questions on any of that stuff? I know I went over a lot of stuff there. Um, but did, did you all, did it all make sense how I explain everything as far as a calendar? Do you have anything that, you know, you didn't quite understand or you want me to go over or explain a little bit better? Um, and if you do, I'm more than happy to do that. If you got any questions at all or comments or anything. So, uh, let's see here. Okay, so Stephanie, Courtney, are you guys still there tuning in or did I, did I throw too much information at you? <laughs> Unless I'm having an issue with my live stream. Well... I don't know if I'm having an issue with my live stream. I don't know if you guys are still there or not. It shows that you're in the room, but um, maybe something maybe something broke on the live stream too. So, okay. Well, anyways, so that's the essence of the Hebrew calendar. So uh, hopefully what I explained made sense. Um, but if not, I can always go through it again another time if anyone has any questions on it. Uh, but thank you. Thank you guys for coming on the live stream. I really appreciate it. And if you do want me to go over any of this again in the future, I'm more than happy to do that. So thanks very much. And uh, I will probably do this. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do for my next live stream, but I'm going to try to do a scheduled live stream from here on out. So maybe I'll, um, you know, maybe around, uh, I'm thinking like 8, 8.30 Central Time on Mondays or Tuesday nights, I'm thinking. So, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm glad you're able to tune in. I hope I didn't confuse you. I threw a lot of information there at you guys. So... Um, so hopefully that made sense, but for anybody who wants to go try to use this calendar system on HeapCal, it's kind of, kind of got it all put together, and you can actually print it out and, and be able to keep track of things that way, so it makes it really easy, so, um, so anyways, but yeah, I probably will do live streams, I'm thinking, you know, maybe around 8.30 on Mondays or Tuesdays, and then I'll probably pick a topic and try to do something each week with it when I do that, so, so anyways, all right, uh, it was a lot, yeah. It was a lot. I agree. <laughs> Hopefully a recap uh, sometime. Yeah, I had to figure out how to make it concise. Uh, I, I can be very, I can use a lot of words sometimes, and I need to figure out how to make it a lot simplified for people to digest it a little bit better. So, um, so yeah, I definitely will do that. Um, so I'm going to, in fact, maybe I'll even do like that. 
as Stephanie was bringing up earlier, I should do TikTok videos like to, to kind of map this out and explain it to people. So that might be a good thing to do. So, so anyways, all right. Well, having said that, I'm going to head out. But thank you so much for coming on the live stream, everyone that's on here. And uh, I will see you next time we do the live stream. So God bless you all. Um, thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. So uh, thank you. And thank you guys for moderating, too. I really appreciate that. Um, that, that actually means a lot. So, all right. God bless you. And I will see you next time I happen to be on a live stream. So everyone take care. Have a good week.